What's going on guys? In this video we're going to dive into microservices and talk about what they are, why they're important, and how they can be used to build scalable applications. We're going to also look at some other architectures such as monolithic as well as SOA or service oriented architecture and then we're going to build a simple project that uses microservices with Node.js and a framework called Molecular that is actually used to, uh, to build microservices. So hope you guys enjoy it and let's get into it. All right, so before we get started, I just want to say that this video is for learning purposes. It's not me saying you should now build all your applications using microservices. And I feel like I need to say that because when I make videos, a good chunk of people just think that I'm, I'm trying to promote a certain way of doing things and you should always do it this way, which is almost never the case. So I feel like I need to say that. Um, this is more for people that just want to learn more about microservices. Maybe you recently got a position where you're going to be working on you know, enterprise level applications and you're, you need to learn more about microservices. All right, so let's get into it. Before we look at microservices, I think it's important to understand what monolithic architecture is, which is sort of the original architecture. This is probably what you're used to. This is kind of the stepping stone for most developers. And this means that the entire application is built as one single unit and all the code is tightly coupled together. So this makes it easy to develop, test, and deploy the application. Um, with monolithic architecture, developers have a clear understanding of the application structure and functionality, and making changes is straightforward since everything is in one place. And it's also cheaper in most cases because you have a relatively simple infrastructure as the application is a, a monolith. And since all the components of the applications are bundled together, there's less overhead in terms of managing multiple services and databases and so on. So these applications are typically, typically developed and run with uh, a single stack, whatever that may be. This also simplifies the process of development, maintenance, and deployment. Now where you can start to run into trouble is as your code base expands, as your monolithic application grows, it can become difficult to scale and maintain, and you can start to run into some limitations. And again, this is really for, for large applications. You're not really going to be using microservices for your to-do app or anything like that. So if you're building applications by yourself or with a small team, chances are most of your projects will use this monolithic structure. But if you're working on larger enterprise level projects, you may find that microservices are a better fit, which we'll talk about next. And I should mention that this is a very simplistic overview of monolithic architecture. There's also specific design patterns within the structure, such as MVC, client server, the layer pattern, and, and many others. All right, so now that we know what the monolithic architecture is, let's talk about microservices. So in a nutshell, they, they structure an application as a collection of small, loosely coupled services that focus on specific business functions. And each service is self-contained and can be deployed, developed, deployed, and scaled independently. So for instance, you may have a service that handles user authentication, and then another that handles user profiles, another that handles the product catalog, and each service is responsible for a specific domain or functionality within the application. And these microservices can communicate with each other over a network using protocols like HTTP. So when you scale a microservices application, you can scale individual services independently based on their load. And this allows you to optimize resource usage and improve performance. And you can use something called a load balancer to distribute incoming requests to different services and distribute that load evenly. And I probably should have included a load balancer in this diagram. So microservices are not tied to any specific technology or programming language. You can use anything you want. For instance, you may have a service that requires high throughput. So you can use a language like Go, which is known for its performance. Another service may require complex business logic. So you could use something like Python, which is known for its readability. And then you could use, let's say, Node.js to build a service that requires real-time communication because Node is you know, known for its event-driven architecture. And these could all be part of the same application, all these different stacks, all these different technologies. Now, some of the downsides of microservices are that they do add a lot of complexity to an application that would be completely unnecessary for a small project. 
and there's complexities in terms of infrastructure, deployment, communication between services, and so on. They also require more infrastructure to manage, and it can be a lot more expensive to run. And there's a lot of operational practices that would be overkill for smaller projects. And DevOps is definitely, um, you know, tools and practices are going to be crucial in infrastructure for microservices. So things like Docker or Kubernetes. So as I mentioned earlier, they're not going to be the right tool for every job. In fact, I would say that they're, they're rarely the right tool for beginner to inter intermediate level developers and applications. Um, but as you grow and you work on larger projects, they can be a really powerful tool for, for building scalable applications. Now, when it comes to deployment, monolithic applications are deployed as a single unit. This is probably what you're used to. The infrastructure is much simpler, and so is the, the entire process. But it can be problematic with really large projects. You know, if you, if you only need to update a small part of the application, you still have to redeploy the entire thing. And with microservices, you can deploy each service independently, which makes it easier to scale and maintain that application. And you can also use, like I said, containerization technologies like Docker to, to package each service with its dependencies, which makes it easy to deploy and run services in any environment. Now, when it comes to microservices, APIs define the contract or the interface through which services interact, and it specifies the endpoints, the data formats, and protocols used for communication. And the API gateway is a common pattern used in microservices architecture, and it acts as a single point of entry for all client requests, and then it routes them to the appropriate services. And it can also handle authentication, rate limiting, caching, and other stuff. Now, microservices can evolve independently without affecting other services as long as they adhere to the agreed upon API contract. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you have experience working with APIs. For instance, when you make a request to a REST API, you're using the HTTP protocol, you're sending a request to the server, and then that server sends back a response in a specific format like JSON or XML. And this is how microservices can communicate with each other. And I've done a lot of projects in courses and tutorials where we create an API or a back end with something like Node or Python, and then we create a front end with something like React or Vue. And usually we deploy the front end and back end together, which would make it a monolith using you know, a monolithic uh, uh, architecture. If you deploy your back end completely separate from your front end, then your back end API is essentially a service. It can be more considered a service in the context of uh, a service-oriented architecture, or SOA, which I'm actually going to talk about next. Um, but to make something like that a microservices architecture, you would further break down the backend API into smaller services like an authentication service, a user service, product, whatever, you know, whatever the, the application does. And each one would be responsible for a specific domain or functionality within that application. And you could also deploy them all separately. All right, so that brings me to a third architecture pattern that I think is, is relevant to this, and that's SOA, or service-oriented architecture. So SOA was coined in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it's often compared to the microservices architecture in that it does structure an application as a collection of services, and these services communicate with each other, but they do it usually with something called an enterprise service bus, or ESB, which handles message routing, uh, applying business rules, and so on. Now, there are some key differences between SOA and microservices. So first, we have communication, because microservices can communicate with each other over a network using protocols like HTTP, whereas SOA... Um, uses uh, 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 some kind of middleware such as ESB, Enterprise Service Bus, as you can see in the, the image here. And this makes, more, makes it more complex, and it also makes it a single point of failure because, as you can see in the diagram, if the ESB fails, then all SOA services will be impacted, um, whereas with microservices, if one service fails, it doesn't bring down the entire application. Microservices are also more fine-grained than SOA services. Each microservice is responsible for a specific domain and functionality within the application, whereas SOA services are more coarse-grained 
and can be responsible for multiple domains or functionalities. So to give you a practical example, using SOA, you may have an inventory management service for an e-commerce application, but the microservices approach would break that inventory management service down into smaller services like an availability checking service, a fulfillment service, accounting service, so everything is more fine-grained. And then when it comes to data, microservices are responsible for their own data management, whereas SOA services can share data through a common data store, as you can see in the diagram. So there's some other differences as well, but these are some of the main ones. SOA was, was popular in the early 2000s, but it kind of fell out of favor because it was too complex and difficult to implement, where microservices are more lightweight and a more flexible approach to building applications. All right, so we kind of went over a lot of this, but I just want uh, to kind of summarize the pros and cons. So for pros, we have scalability. As I mentioned, you can scale individual services independently based on their load, and this allows you to optimize your resource usage and improve performance. You have flexibility, so you can use different technologies for different services based on their requirements. Uh, resilience. So if one service fails, it doesn't bring down the entire application. The other services can continue to function and you can implement um, retry and circuit breaker patterns to handle failures gracefully. And then it's modular and decentralized. So they promote a, a modular architecture where complex applications are broken down into smaller, more manageable components and it facilitates easier collaboration and testing and deployment. And then team autonomy, so each service can be developed, deployed, and scaled independently by different teams, and this allows you to scale your development efforts and improve productivity. Now for some of the cons, so obviously there's quite a bit of additional complexity in terms of development, monitoring, management, um, coordinating communication between multiple services, things like that. Operational overhead, so managing a, a large number of microservices requires robust infrastructure and DevOps practices. Tasks such as service discovery, load balancing, logging, uh, security, this all becomes more complex and re resource intensive and also more expensive. Um, data management complexity, so microservices often have their own databases or data stores which can lead to data duplication, inconsistency, synchronization issues. So increased development time, when you're, when you're breaking a big program into smaller ones, that can take more time and effort than just making one big program. So it's like splitting up a, a big job into smaller tasks. It needs more planning and coordination. And then debugging and troubleshooting. So sometimes identifying and diagnosing issues in a distributed microservices architecture can be more challenging as well. So basically, these, these cons or disadvantages can pretty much be summed up into complexity and cost. All right, so that's my introduction to microservices. Now I want to jump in and write some code, and we're going to keep things simple. Obviously, this is just a, an introductory crash course, but we're going to be using Node.js as well as a, a framework called Molecular. So let's get into it. All right, guys, so I've mentioned it a few times, but you can use whatever technology you want to build an application using microservices architecture. Node.js is a popular option, and that's what I'm most familiar with, so that's what we're going to be using uh, for this project. And you could just use Express if you wanted to, but we're going to use a framework called Molecular that's specifically made to create applications using microservices and it includes a lot of the things that you need that we're not going to have to set up manually. So I just want to go over a couple of those things. So one would be a load balancer. We talked a little bit about load balancing. This is the process of distributing incoming network traffic across multiple servers or computing resources to optimize performance and molecular includes a load balancer by default. So if you were using Express, you would typically need to set this up using a reverse proxy server with Nginx or HA proxy or something like that. So uh, as you can see, where does it say it right here, it has a built-in load balancer. Um, fault tolerance, that's another thing. So that's the ability of a system to continue operating and providing services in the presence of failures or errors. And again, Molecular has that built in. Uh, service discovery is another one. So this is a mechanism that allows the services 
to dynamically locate and communicate with each other, and it enables services to discover the network locations, like the IP addresses or ports of other services. And Molecular maintains a local service registry within each node, a node being a, a microservice instance, in the cluster. So when a service starts up, it registers itself with the local registry, providing information such as its name, version, available actions, and so on. All right, and you'll see this in the terminal when we start up our services. So I just want to kind of, you know, have you get the picture that Molecular is, is giving us a lot right out of the box, stuff that you would most likely have to set up in a more manual way if you weren't using it. And we're not doing any deployment, and that's actually a big part of using the microservices architecture. Um, basically, we're just going to have some fun and create a couple services using Molecular just so you can kind of see how that works. All right, so open up your, your text editor. I'm using VS Code, but you can use whatever you want. Also, open up a terminal because we do need to install this with NPM. So first thing we're going to do is run NPM, and I already have a folder here called Microservices Example. So just go ahead and create a folder, open it up, and then we'll do NPM init-y. That will give us our package.json. Then we're going to install Molecular with NPM install Molecular, and it's L-E-R. Okay, so that's installed, and we're not, we're not going to be working in the browser or anything. This is all within the terminal. We're not going to have any UI or anything like that. And let's create an index.js, so this will be our main entry point. And before we create the main services that I want to create, I'm just going to show you how to create something very, very simple. Basically just says, it's basically a hello world, a greeter service. So first thing we're going to do, actually before we do that, in order to use import, so ES6, modules we have to go to our package.json and let's just go right here and say type whoops we want to say type and set that to module if you want to use es6 modules and not common js which i don't use common js anymore so let's say import and then we're going to do service broker okay so what we do is we create something called a broker and you can kind of think of a broker as like a controller it starts and stops services now we do have to initialize it so let's create a variable called broker we're going to set it to new service broker okay and then i'll just put a comment here we'll say greeter service and we'll take that broker and then where there's a, a method called create service so we want to run that and then that takes in an object with the service name so for the name we'll, we'll say greeter and then a, a service can have actions which are basically functions so we'll say actions and we'll have an object and then let's have an action called say hello so we format it like this and then an action can take in a context so it basically takes in a, a parameter here. And all I want to do from this service is return. And we'll use some uh, back ticks here and just say hello. And that context, let's say CTX, is going to have a params object, uh, params. And then I'm going to call it name. OK, so I'm going to have an object passed in with a name value. And I'm just going to print that to the console. All right, so we created a, a, a broker or initialized a broker. We created a greeter service with a say, say hello action. So down at the bottom here, um, we want to call broker start, which is going to give us a promise. And you could use the dot then syntax, but I much prefer to use async await. So what I'm going to do is create an async function here. And we'll call this, you can call this anything. I'm going to call it start app. And then we're going to await on the broker. And there's a method called start. Okay, so we start the broker. And then let's say const, we're going to get a response from await and then broker dot call. And this dot call, this is where we can call an action of a service. So in here we're going to pass in greeter dot and then say hello because I want to call the greeter service say hello um, action but I want to pass in this this context object with a name. So that's going to be the second 
uh, argument that I pass in. So let's say name, and we'll set that to John. All right, and then what I'll do is just console log the response, and then I'm going to use the broker to stop the service, which it, it does stop when the process exits, but it's, it's good just to call this anyway. And then we just want to call our start app. And then let's run the file with node index. And you can see a bunch of stuff happens here. We see hello John, which is actually what our service does. It's the only thing our actual service does, but all this other stuff happened. So it creates a, well, there's no namespace to find, but you can have a namespace, the node ID, which is the microservice instance. It creates that. Um, a strategy, a discoverer. So remember we talked about service discovery, a serializer, a validator, and then the node service is registered. The greeter service, which is what we created, is registered, and then it was started. So service broker with two services started. Hello, John, and then the service is stopped. So it does all this for us, uh, which is nice. Now, we're not going to use this. I just wanted to show you the, the very basic syntax in creating a, a microservice with molecular, and this is how you do it. So we use a broker, create the service, and so on. Now let's create something that's a little more, a little more real life, I guess. So I'm actually going to create a folder called services. And I'm going to have three different services. So one is going to be a user service. So we're going to name this user.service.js. And then let's create another one called email.service.js. And then we'll create another called auth.service. Now these are all going to be just like mock-up. We're not going to... Um, actually have a database where we have users and authentication, the email, basically we're going to just mock an email um, and just print it out to the console. But in real life, you would use like node mailer or something like that. All right. So first thing is the let's do the user service. And for that, I just want two actions, one to create a new user and one to get the users. And again, we're not going to use a database or anything. We'll just keep it all in memory. We'll just have an array. Um, so we're going to format it like we did here. In fact, we can uh, probably just copy these two lines. Okay, and then let's create an array for our users. Now, in reality, this would be like coming from a database. And then we're going to take our broker and create a service. Pass in an object. Let's give it a name. We'll call it user. And then we want our actions. So we'll have a uh, create user and pass in context. Okay, and then we're just going to do this. We'll say const and that context will have an object with a username and email. So we're going to destructure that. So let's say ctx dot params. That's the object that we pass in and we'll get the username and email, no password. Uh, we'll just do username and email. And then let's see, const, we'll say new user. And I, I do want it to have an ID. So what we'll do is come up here and, and let's just create a function called generate ID. And I'm just going to do something very simple. We'll just do return math dot floor. So we're going to round down math dot random and we'll multiply that by a thousand and plus one. So basically we're just going to have a number between one and a thousand. Obviously you wouldn't do this in a real application, but it's fine for this. Okay. So back down here, let's, we have our new user. Let's set that to an object and in that object we'll have ID and set that to generate ID. And then let's do username and email. And then we're just going to take our users array and push on to it, the new user. And then we're just going to return the new user. All right, so very simple. And then we'll have an even simpler function to get users. So get users. Um, now this, 
isn't going to need any any context but I mean we can just pass it in anyway so we'll say get users and we're just going to simply return uh, return the users array and I forgot my comma here yeah we want to do that okay now what I'm going to do is just export the broker so we'll say export default broker All right, now I'm going to use this service in the index file. So let's jump back over to that. And let's see, we don't we don't need the service broker here. We can get rid of this stuff. Actually, we can get rid of everything. Yeah, we'll just get rid of it all. And then let's import our user service. So we'll say user service from and we want to go. Let's see dot slash services slash user service dot JS. And then let's have an async function called start uh, start app. And I want to start to put a comment here. We'll say this will start our services. So await user service dot start. Okay, so that'll start it. Then I'm going to have a try catch here where we where we do our actions. So let's go ahead and simulate user creation. Okay, so we can do that. Let's create a new user object by calling our action. So we can take our user service and we're going to do dot call just like we did with the, the broker in the because remember this user service is the broker for this service and we want to call the user service and then the create user action and then remember that takes in an object with username which I'm just going to say John and email say uh, John at Gmail. Okay, so now let's do a console log and we'll just say new user created And we'll put a comma here and we'll show the new user. And then let's get the users. So we'll say const users because remember we have an action that does that. So we're just going to await on user service dot call. And you know what I forgot to do? Um, these are to return a promise. So in the actions, we need to make these asynchronous. So we just want to add a sync there. All right. So now we're going to call and this time we're going to call user dot and then get users. And that doesn't take any um, doesn't take any context. And then let's log. We'll say console log. All users and then users. And then if there's an error, let's just do a console log. And we'll just say error. Uh, oops, we need quotes here. Let's say error. Okay, and then I'm going to have a finally because no matter what, I want to stop the service. So let's say await user uh, user whoops user service dot stop. And then we just want to start the app. All right, so let's see if that works. We'll clear this up. Node index. All right, so you can see that the name, um, not name, the user service is registered and the user service started. And then the functionality of that service is this right here. New user created has an ID of 830, username, email. And then we got a list of all the users, which obviously we only have that one. That's from the get users action. All right, so that's just a, an example of how you can create a service. So now let's create an email service. So we'll go into email and I'm just going to copy. I'll just copy the whole user service and then we'll just get rid of the actions and get rid of this function. Get rid of that. All right, so We're going to create a service called email 
And then as far as actions, I just want to have one called send email. And that will take in context. Okay, and then we're going to destructure from the context params. So we want to set that to CTX dot params. And what we're going to get from that is going to be the recipient, the subject and the content. Okay, and then we're just going to, let's say, simulate uh, simulated email logic. And we'll just do a console log here and let's put in some back ticks. We'll say sending email. If you want, you can install node mailer or something like that and actually send the email. But there's really no reason for us to. I just want to show you how to use molecular. I'm not really, you know, we're not building this for a reason. So let's say with subject um, and then we'll output subject and then let's do another console log and here we'll say content and I'll put the content and then we'll do a return here and we'll return say email sent to and then we want the recipient. Okay, so that's it. Now let's go back to um, index and let's bring in the email service. So these are going to these are completely separate from each other. Obviously, the user and email service. Change that email. Okay, then we want to start it just like we did with the user service. Okay, and then down here, let's uh, let's go right here and say simulate sending email. So we'll have a variable called email result. Set that to await email service, and then we want to do dot call, and we want to call the email service and the send email action. And then we want to pass into that an object with a recipient. And the recipient, I'm going to take the new user that was just registered and take that email address. Okay, because basically we're sending a welcome email. So the subject will say welcome to our platform. And then for the content, we'll say thank you for signing up. Okay, and then we'll console log. Let's go underneath the email result and we'll console log email result. Okay, so now we'll come down here, clear this up. Let's run the file. And now we should see at the top here. Let's see. So service user started and sir and email service is registered. Email service started. And we see all the stuff from creating the user. And then we see this sending email to John at Gmail, which is the user that was created. Welcome to our platform. Email sent to John at Gmail. Okay, so we use both of these services, one to create the, the user and one to send the email, and they're completely separate. So if something happened with the user service, or, or let's say the email service, it shouldn't affect the user service. All right, now I'm going to do one more, which is going to be the auth service. So let's go into that file. Actually, I'll just copy. I'll copy what we have in the email service and then we'll get rid of the action. What we have for actions, change that to off. And we're just going to simulate authenticating a user. So let's say async. Auth user. takes in CTX and we'll send a user, we'll say username and password. CTX params and then let's just do a simple if and we'll say uh, if the username is equal to admin and the password is equal 
to password, then let's return an object and we'll say success true and we'll have a message auth was successful okay and then let's say else then we'll return success false and we'll say auth failed and that's it obviously this would be much more complex uh, if it were real but again this is just to give you an idea of how you would do stuff like this so let's copy that down and this is going to be the auth service so auth service and then you would start this auth service start I uh, and I forgot to do this stop down here for the email for the email so let's do that and the auth service stop and then let's go right below the email I'm just going to put a space here so right below where we log the email result let's say simulate auth so const auth result set that to await the auth ser service and we're going to call the call method and then auth is the name and then auth user is the action and did i make that async yeah okay so we're going to call that and we're going to pass in there the context object which is going to have username So let's take the the new user dot username which is John so this should fail and then password uh password we'll say password all right and then we want to just do a quick console log and we'll say auth result auth result and yeah that should do it so let's try it out all right so all the three services should be started so email auth started and then down here we're seeing success false message auth failed and of course if i change the username to admin and then i run it again we should see Uh oh, I forgot my quotes. And we see auth was successful. All right, so yeah, pretty um pretty simple examples, but I just wanted again just to show you how you would set up these services using molecular. All right, and and of course the the main part of this video was really the beginning to talk about what microservices are just so you better under, better understand that um yeah this was just to you know have a little bit of fun and if you want to try to make this a little more complex again use something like node mailer implement mongo db with mongoose do stuff like that uh, i always encourage to to build on to the tutorials that i do all right so that's it guys i hope you enjoyed this hope you learned something from it and i will see you next time